Hello YouTube, it's William here with Gopher Nuffers Trains, and in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the 2022 Madison Mad City Train Show. Decided to stop by this weekend, I ended up going both days because I was only a few short minutes away at the UW-Madison campus, and I wanted to share everything I saw and did with you guys. So as you can see, we're walking in. The show is held at the Alliant Energy Center uh, once per year. Uh, I don't remember what the cost to get in, as thankfully, my friends over at Hobby Stop provided me with a free Admit One ticket. Uh, here's the lobby area. They had a few sets set up and some really cool displays by various preservation societies. But, of course, the main show is inside the Exhibition Center. So, essentially what we're going to do is what I do for my other train show videos. I'm going to walk around uh, with this voiceover narration summarizing most of what I saw. And as you can see, this show is not small. It's a pretty big show. I ended up having a lot of fun finding some great things over the two days that I got to be there. And, uh, yeah. So, the order is going to be kind of discontinuous, but um, essentially we're starting on the right-hand side of the building. I found that overall a lot of the vendors had a lot of N scale and O scale. HO gauge wasn't as saturated as I'm usually used to. So got the Bessemer coil car. At this point, by the time that I'm filming, I've already made uh, most, if not all, of my purchases for the day, so, you know, yeah. The first day, this booth had some horribly weathered steam locomotives, which have since sold because they were at dirt cheap prices. This booth, I don't remember exactly where they uh, are from or who they are, but they had a great selection of buildings, but the main attraction was to the left, and this was quite a large booth. Unfortunately, they were not super willing to negotiate until the end of the second day, but I did end up buying something from them. They had a decent selection of passenger cars from Concor, Athern, AHM, and any manufacturer you so desire, as long as you took the time to look. Another thing that I found slightly unfortunate is that a lot of vendors this time around had sealed boxes that made it either difficult to browse or had mismatched contents, which could not be verified by opening the boxes or digging through them all. But anyways, um, so yeah, <clears throat> there were a couple of great prices on some diesels there. A Green Bay and Western Mogul for $50 from IHC, which isn't terrible, but I've seen them go for cheaper. A couple really nice AHM Baltimore and Ohio boxcars that I was considering, but didn't really have the money for. Now, you're going to see me skipping over a lot of tables, and the primary reason for that is that it is just generally uninteresting stock. I'd been through the show many, many times beforehand, and I just thought I'd give you guys an overall feel for the stuff that people who watch my channel would be interested in. Uh, Broadway Limited 282 Mikado, I believe, if I remember correctly. Now, coming up on the right-hand side, not here, but the booth after this is one of my least favorite vendors in all of train show dumb. This guy, uh, I don't remember his name, I think it's Bill, which is unfortunate, but um, he comes to my local train show every time. We will go back and take a look at his booth, but he doesn't take kindly to people filming, so I had to skip over that. This is the Summerfields Trains and Hobby booth, and it's one of my favorites at the show, primarily because I love supporting that hobby shop. Uh, it's just uh, northeast, or northwest of Milwaukee, excuse me, and they always have some great prices and a great selection of used items. And in my opinion, they had at their booth one of the best items in the show, which you will see slightly. They had a great selection of N-Gage and HO-Gage equipment, uh, quite a few passenger cars, and some really nice sets to go along with it. So we got some Milwaukee Road Scene Master cars, and uh, what appeared to be custom, I think, blue box-ish cars. I didn't really take the time to verify. But anyways, I'm just going to let the next couple videos speak for themselves, but they had some really great stuff. Here you can see that they had an AHM Riverossi E-Unit set with a bunch of passenger cars. Of course, the heavyweights. Um, while I was filming this, I was actually waiting for a chance to look at what these guys are standing in front of, and right here's that clip. So buried amongst all these boxes, they had a couple of Riverossi A and B sets. This one was the B set for Norfolk and Western, and the A set for the uh, Milwaukee Road Chippewa. But behind it was what is, in my opinion, the star attraction. And I don't know how Summerfields keeps finding all of these, but they had another Riverossi F7 Hiawatha Hudson set. Uh, this one was priced much steeper than the last one. The one that I bought from their store was $300 out the door. This one was 500 
Both sets did include the five car set though, so there's always that to think about. Anyways, skipping over towards the center of the show now, um, I bypassed a lot of the layouts so that I could keep filming what I could find on the tables. This is where we start getting into the meat of the used motive power and HO scale stock that they had at this particular show. Intermixed with all of that was a bunch of really interesting memorabilia and other things, like just random selections of N-scale and HO equipment amongst magazines, uh, signal locks, lanterns, books, uh, that's a, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I was surprised by how not super busy the show was both days that I was there. It was generally pretty empty, uh, lots of freedom to roam around, and uh, sellers were, at least in most cases, willing to move product. This booth I did end up picking some things up from, which you will see. There's what appeared to be an RDC chassis. And then underneath it is this really unusual brass shell. It had no running gear, but it was only priced at $50, so if you happen to be looking for that particular locomotive, that would have been a great deal for you. I didn't pick up any of the steam from this booth. I noticed this Bachman train set 060, which is actually one of the later ones, so it's quite nice. But anyways, if you step inside their little uh, area-ish thing here, you'll notice they've got a number of passenger cars for sale. They've got some custom painted AHM stuff, which obviously I don't touch. A couple of brass car bodied um, units, and some weird miscellaneous odd parts cars. These two uh, were of particular interest to me, and I will explain why a little later. In any case, uh, there were some... This was like a dealer returns section, so everything there was incredibly cheap, but it was sold as is non-guaranteed running condition. The previous vendor had a lot of really interesting track switches and setups and just oddball pieces that if you were building a layout and needed a particular track section, chances are it was in those bins. Walking back around this booth, um, we're going to take a look at some of the more rolling stock heavy sections. They had lots of trailers, and then just individually wrapped cabooses, boxcars, and other such things. I did end up buying a piece of rolling stock from over here, which of course you will see at the end of the video. Switching over to the other side, just for a brief second, they had lots of t-shirts. That booth was entirely shirts, so obviously I didn't hang around there for very long. But they also had a good selection of signals, detail parts, and other railroad peripherals that just would generally help spice up your layout. Prices at that booth were actually quite good. They were more a liquidator. This booth I also ended up purchasing something from. Uh, they had some rolling stock. Now, the vendor here was particularly firm on his prices. I did manage to get $2 off of what I was purchasing, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's not spectacular. He had a lot of sealed engines, which, in my opinion, this is not a good idea. If you're a vendor, don't do this. It prevents buyers from being able to test at the show. Some of the things that primarily interested me were this A set for the Crescent Limited, a couple Milwaukee Road IHC passenger cars, a Dreyfus baggage, which you can see there at the bottom. If you look in the back, there's an AHM MOW PRR set. And then up here is where they had a lot of their interesting steamers. This right here, the Mantua Lindbergh engine, number 460, was incredibly tempting. However, the price was far too high. I really do wish I could have taken that guy home, though. Their stock had significantly decreased from the previous day. Uh, a lot of their engines disappeared. They had some really nice Spectrum stuff. Another Mantua 460, but not the limited edition. Some kit engines, if that's your thing, and a few custom Riverossi peaches, pieces, excuse me, which I obviously avoided like the plague. On the opposite end of the booth, they had a lot of rolling stock, and then as we wrap around to the other side, they had plenty of N-Scale stuff, including the best selection of passenger sets that I've seen at a show for N-Scale. Uh, a lot of these were actually priced very reasonably and quite tempting if you have the engines for these sets. Um, I passed on them because I'm pretty well set in terms of N-Scale passenger equipment for now, but I will consider them if I ever need to expand that roster. Now, over here they had a lot of Gilbert American Flyer HO, and the reason I showed this one is that unusual little 060 tank engine. It was something like $400. I don't know why, I've never seen one, so if any of you guys know anything about that engine and why it might be special, please leave a comment. 
We're walking over to another booth now, and this had a couple of really, really cool items that I wish I could have grabbed had I had the money. First of all, they had lots of really nice rolling stock, including another city of San Francisco, which is funny because the booth directly behind me was selling one for $20, but this was what I was focused on over here. The Marks 396 Copper 6-inch tin plate steamer and associated set. At $150 with the copper in that condition, it would have been a fantastic deal. I just didn't have the coin to spend on it at the time. Underneath they had some interesting die-cast locomotives, a pair of Gilbert HO060s, an Aristocraft 060, which, yeah, um, and a Lionel 462, however, the prices on those were quite steep. They also had a great selection of flyer and O-gauge equipment, which I took a brief look at just to, you know, see. Anyways, moving back further down the line, and I know the layout of the show is a little bit confusing, but there's no exactly continuous route that takes me around to all the booths that I wanted to show you guys in a very con congruous fashion. So the way I would describe the show is that on the far right hand side they had a buying and selling booth, uh, buying and selling area, then sets, then the center section, then more sets, and then the final buying and selling area. If, re if you rewind slightly to take a look at that uh, Super O set from the pre-war era, that's about $1,300. This booth also had a couple of kit engines uh, that were severely overpriced, as well as this really expensive uh, Baltimore and Ohio Big Six. I think it said 115 on the tag, which is, in my opinion, far too much. This booth had more reasonable prices. Um, I was semi-interested in this Canadian Pacific passenger set, but they had duplicates. These Walther's 20th Century cars were absolutely stunning, and I wish I had the money and the time to acquire a full set. Anyways, moving on down the line, they had some really nice prices on a bunch of passenger sets, a couple assorted diesel locomotives, and other things. This booth, like I said, was present at the Titletown train show about a year ago, and I bought a K4 from them quite cheaply. Anyways, some Spectrum diesels at dirt cheap prices, in my opinion, $20 to $25, somewhere $50. That Bachman box up top had a Niagara in it, however, it was priced far higher than what some of the other vendors were asking for the identical product, which you will end up seeing later. Quite the stack of Genesis diesels, they had a Mantua logger, which you don't see. And interestingly enough, they had some of the Broadway Limited UP early challengers. They had two of them. Apparently they were either $700 or $900. I couldn't tell. They also had one of the FEFs. This one was painted unlettered and a Milwaukee Road S3 Northern. Here you can see some of the other... Um, <clears throat> Accessories that they had, they had a good number of building kits, operating accessories, and other things on the other side, as well as a bunch of Woodland Scenics just plug equipment. Uh, obviously quite expensive for some of this stuff, but if you need to furnish your layout, this would have been a great booth to stop at. I did notice that there were a lot of buildings and scenery materials at the show this time, so if you were in the market for that sort of thing, it would have been a good time to show up. This booth had a lot of blue box cars, that one interesting dummy, and they had a couple loose engines lying around. And the thing that caught my eye most at this booth, which you will see in just a second, is the Bachman Overland Limited. This is the modern version with the updated Niagara Drive for $30. I probably actually would have picked that engine up if it didn't have a broken pilot. The pilot was gone. In any case, um, you can see a couple of the other modeling displays and such. There's a lot of O-gauge, a lot of random track equipment, some G-gauge, and I came back around here and this booth was interesting because it had a lot of just sort of discontin uh, discontinuous parts and other random things. Interestingly enough, they had uh, a die-cast Tyco shark nose, but it was only the shell and it had been custom painted, which you will see in just a moment. They had a couple really inexpensive parts engines that would not have been bad for repair. Uh, this was interesting, they had a Lionel Texas Special B unit in HO. If it weren't $10, I would have picked it up, but you know. Unusual Varney Southern Pacific Observation Car in all metal, and here's that Tyco shell I was telling you about. Um, unfortunately missing all the parts, but those are actually quite interesting locomotives. If you haven't seen my video on the one that I have, please check it out. Oh yeah, and a horribly weathered O4O. Oh, oh.
Moving on, this is the first booth that I stopped at and picked something up, which you will see later, but they didn't take too kindly to me filming, so I had to make it very quick. They had some Riverossi passenger cars, the Empire State Express OBS car was my favorite of the lot, and a couple of European locomotives like an LMS Class 5, a couple of French locomotives, and some Lilliput rolling stock. Now, we're returning to the right-hand side of the show to take a look at my least favorite vendor's booth, just to show you guys. Um, to give you an idea, those two IHC Pacifics, he's asking 124 a piece. So, it's definitely not uh, for the financially-minded individual. A lot of his rolling stock is also grotesquely overpriced. Some of it is reasonable-ish, but um, dealing with the actual vendor is a massive pain. So... If you see this guy at a show, I don't really recommend talking to him. It's either pay the sticker price and get out, or uh, listen to me berate you. He's in the back there, you can just barely see him. Uh, I forgot to move this clip while editing. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, this is a little bit of a mistake, but it gives you an idea of some of the displays and running action you will see later if you decide to keep watching. Anyways, at this point we're back towards the front. Um, we're looking at this unusual Varney display case, and this was a, like, historical railroad artifacts booth that surprisingly had a lot of brass engines, and some of these were quite interesting prototypes. Obviously, the prices were far higher than anything I was prepared to spend that day, but they had a Canadian Pacific Jubilee in brass, which is incredibly interesting. This booth had a lot of just miscellaneous, assorted, random rolling stock and other miscellaneous things, like I said. Um, you will see they do have a couple of parts uh, repair engines later, another Bessemer coil coach. Those things appear to be coming out of the woodwork this time. I didn't pick any up, but they were there. Moving on down, they did have some really nice Fox Valley Models Hiawatha cars. I'd love to assemble a full set of uh, FVM train Hiawatha someday, sorry trying to remember what I wanted to say, but anyways, here we are at the parts engines category. They had two repainted engines, an IHC-282 and this beautiful Mantua 462, or 4, 442 Atlantic. At $30, it would have been a great deal for somebody, but it was repainted and I had no desire to touch it. This booth I actually made my biggest purchase from, and that was on the first day that I was here. For some reason, he had everything covered up with blue tarps until he um, actually showed up, but we will return to that later. This was another Artifacts DVDs sort of vendor, and they had a couple parts bins uh, assorted stuff underneath, so I did stop to take a look at that. But um, nothing spectacularly interesting at this booth. We're now on the left-hand side of the building, so all the way on the opposite end of the show. Um, and yeah, so... Trying to take a look at some of the stuff in here with you guys. A uh, couple people asked me what I was doing filming, so I stopped recording for a brief moment to explain, and then uh, just resumed looking around. There was an interesting, very early Broadway Limited 282 Mikado in Milwaukee Road that had QSI sound. Never actually seen a model from BLI that is not PCM or just Paragon 1, so that was cool to see. They had a lot of nice diesels at this particular booth, as well as some higher-end cabooses and other such appointments, but not a lot of used things that I would have been interested in or really able to afford. I thought this was interesting. They had some really cool Chicago Northwestern documents, books, and other sort of things. Difficult to see here, but the only actual modeling item at this booth is a series of um, unlettered blue box passenger cars. This vendor also commonly shows up at my local train show, and he just has a ton of rolling stock, occasionally a bunch of assorted diesels. I think the most interesting thing that I saw from this vendor was an entire crate full of just Athern, Alco, PA, and B units, powered, non-powered. Um, they were priced fairly reasonably, but the main interest for me at this booth is the used engines section. And uh, unfortunately, this time, they didn't really have a lot with them. This is a huge, huge vendor, and... Uh, their stuff moves kind of slowly, you'd be surprised. There was an interesting MRC uh, Black Widow SP unit that I thought about picking up, but the price just ended up being a little bit too steep for my particular budget. Did stop to take a look at this IHC Premier production run. Um, not this one, this is just a 282 by Mahano. But IHC Mahano Premier production run 280 consolidation in New York Central. I have one of these and it's a spectacular engine. Love how smooth those run. 
They had quite a few brass engines, some really nice ones too. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have the specific brass engine that I was looking for, but they did have a few. Some more IHC stock. And then over there, you'll get a closer shot of that in a minute. But um, they had a couple more brass engines. This one, this nickel plate Hudson, I thought about purchasing because the price was only 150 bucks, but it didn't have the smoke deflectors. And if I'm gonna buy one of those, I want it to be the smoke deflector version. The rest of the booth was just either um, poor condition rolling stock or assorted building parts um, and things that are priced, you know, like that. So here's a closer look at some of their brass engines. That P10462 is gorgeous, but unfortunately it's not the semi-streamlined version that I'd like to get my hands on. Moving on to another booth in the area, this one just had a bunch of assorted miscellaneous rolling stock, a few interesting parts engines, and this was really weird. Apparently it had a carry shell and was entirely brass, and somebody appeared to have barbed wired a chunk of lead in there or something. Never seen a weight addition method that looked like that, but I can't imagine it really helped with rolling stability at all couple of other random parts engines, and unfortunately the parts miscellaneous junk box sort of sections were not either not present at this show or there just wasn't a lot of interesting stuff in them. A lot of it was like really cheap, lifelike rolling stock and other such things. This booth did have some very, very high-end brass though. This was a precision, um, precision scale Hiawatha set. They had one of the streamlined Hiawatha 460s, the one that ran the Northwoods Hiawatha, and a couple other very high-end, expensive, and very gorgeous brass engines. Unfortunately, I did not get a closer shot of them over there, but they, well, they were there. They had a few Spectrum engines at fairly reasonable prices, except the Decapod, which was, I believe, $110 if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, um, the selection is kind of a mixed bag. Especially on this end of the show, I didn't really find a lot that I was super interested in purchasing. And I'm walking over to one specific booth. This is the one in the farthest uh, top left corner to show you one particular item, which you will see in just a moment. They had a few miscellaneous pieces of rolling stock, but a lot more of it was just supplies and equipment and tools and things. They had a bunch of N-scale stuff further down the table, but the main attraction at this booth is the River Rossi turntable, which you're going to see in just a moment. And there she is, with the original box, too. The price was incredibly steep at $165, and I passed on it for that reason. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend more than 20 bucks on something like this, because I simply wouldn't use it. But there it is. It was all original and in... Honestly, fantastic shape for what it was. Um, you don't see these very often. Moving further down the booth, like I said, it's just a bunch of supplies and track work items. At this booth, they had a lot of unusual narrow gauge, what appeared to be ON30 or whatever it is stuff. Uh, essentially, O gauge engines that run on HO track. They're quite large in person. Uh, this is my first time seeing a vendor that really specialized in that sort of thing, so it was unusual and rather different. This booth just had a ton of MPC Aero Lionel, and then this really unusual car right there. If anyone knows what that is, please do let me know. I'd love to learn more about that thing. Anyways, uh, moving further over now, uh, I believe I'm returning to the blue tarp covered area. This was the vendor next to him that had quite a few interesting pre-war and post-war Lionel pieces. This 221 in black was in gorgeous shape, which is why I specifically decided to highlight it. And honestly, for the condition that it was in, the price was understandable. They had a lot more uh, post-war era rolling stock, as well as a 700E uh, MPC era Hudson, I believe. Anyways, now we're returning to the blue, the booth with the blue tarps. Try saying that three times fast. Uh, at this point, all of his stuff had been uncovered, and unfortunately, his prices this time were not at all reasonable. That FEF was $200. Um, I saw him at the Titletown train show about a year ago in Green Bay, and he had some great prices. I bought a few things from him. But like I said, I did end up buying one item from this booth, and it was my biggest purchase. Fortunately, he was willing to negotiate, and I got him down to, in my opinion, a very reasonable price. Um, some really interesting old-time stuff, and his stock had greatly diminished from previous shows. I imagine he managed to move a lot of it, 
Um, I'm also assuming that based on uh, how our negotiations went, he is very willing to be flexible on his prices. So if you see this vendor at a show and he's got something you're interested in, I strongly recommend talking to him. He's quite reasonable, very nice man. Um, helped me out with getting a really, really awesome piece. Had a bunch of other rolling stock on the back end and a few other really nice things here and there just sprinkled throughout. And you're going to see it in a little bit, but he's got an AHM American Railroads Berkshire and a 5405 Hudson on the chair right there. I tried to zoom in and show you. I believe they were priced at $89 a piece, and if he is willing to be flexible, those could be had relatively cheaply. And so actually, this is it for the buying and selling walk around. I've shown you all of the booths that really had anything of any merit. I just wanted to give you a panoramic sweep of these really interesting Lionel pieces. And anyways, I hope you guys enjoy the running and demo of a lot of the sets here and some of them were absolutely outstanding beware volume jump incoming in just a second i believe i went to show you this 2332 gg1 and then it cuts so yeah but anyways um there were some really really spectacular sets here this time here you can see some double heading big boys with quite the large consist i'm not the biggest fan of double headers but it was impressive to see nonetheless now in terms of actual setups, displays, dioramas, and modular layouts, there is a lot going on at this show, and I have quite a bit of footage for you guys to enjoy of these sets in operation. Uh, I'm going to drop out of narrating from here and there so you guys can just enjoy the sights and sounds of what's happening on screen. But uh, yeah, anyways, so here we go. This was an extraordinarily long train of tractors, and I didn't spend a lot of time at this setup because I was still in the mood for buying and selling. Um, some of these layouts were not super remarkable, so I didn't spend a lot of time hanging around. The Chicago Northwestern consist is actually all River Rossi cars, which I thought was great to see some in use on the club layout. But any noteworthy layouts, I will let you know as soon as they come on screen. This uh, particular display was actually one of my favorites at the show. Um, this footage doesn't show anything operating yet. Uh, this consist of ridiculously long hopper cars is being pulled by a single big boy. And fortunately, they did get it moving shortly after I stopped by, and I was able to get a lot of great footage. Uh, scenically, I think this is one of the more impressive layouts, and I did get to see them win an award third place best in show um, for their particular setup. When I say that this big boy is hauling a long consist of cars, I mean a long, long consist of cars. So much so to the point where there was less track between the front of the engine and the rear of the caboose than the entire train occupied, which you will see in just a minute. So now here I'm doing a quick walk around to try to give you guys an idea and sense of scale for just how long this train is. If I had to guess how much money is currently being pulled behind this big boy, these are all fairly detailed and likely rather expensive offers. 
Um, I can't imagine how much this entire consist cost, but you can just barely see the tender of the big boy making it around the corner. Now, this G-scale setup is actually a rather common and popular one. I see it quite a lot, especially at Train Fest in Milwaukee every year. It's one I always remember from when I was a kid. Um, they've got a bunch of loops of just assorted trains, locomotives, consists running around. And right here, this Denver and Rio Grande Mikado is definitely, uh, I suppose, getting its money worth out of its motor. Um, this thing has been bellowing, like just billowing smoke for the entire duration of the show, and there's actually this like epoxy-like substance on the ties from it. It's quite uh, unusual. This, in my opinion, is just about the only proper use for one of these horrendous egg liner things. It's just going up and down and around and around on a perpetual helix. This was actually a really cool and unusual layout. When I stopped by, nothing was running, but you will see it again later. Um, it's a really cool modular layout that has these essentially like boxes that the trains sit inside of. I'd been hoping to catch some signal action on this particular setup, but it was either not operating or I just got unlucky because I was not able to actually spot anything. What shows up in the mail that day? Those two, no, those two forms for the two different accounts that I have. You know what I mean? So you can see the ambience of the light itself. That's true. This particular end scale layout was a real treat to see. That GS4 was running gorgeously. Same with this new consoles. I believe those are, might actually be Milwaukee Road passenger cars. This was another end scale uh, layout directly adjacent to the previous one. Um, the other one was a little bit small, so I didn't really capture too much images or video of it. But this was an interesting bi-level train just running past. This particular layout I do believe won best in show for scenery, and it's not difficult to see why. A um, couple of KCS engines there, and then when I cut away, this is only one side of this particular layout, but um, it just gives you an idea of how scenically beautiful this one is. This particular layout had a really cool uh, CTC control system on display that I wanted to catch for my friend Matt, who's very into that sort of thing. Now this uh, particular layout I probably spent the most time at because they had great scenery and they had a couple great steam engines running. Now I don't know if you've noticed, but this particular freight train interrupts a lot of the shots I had going. Unfortunately they put it on the outer track, so it interrupted just about every single shot I tried to get of this particular Broadway Limited Consolidation. I'd have something beautiful set up, and it would just so happen that the two trains would meet directly in front of my camera. Which was obnoxious, but the entire layout was quite a sight, and I ended up getting some enjoyable video footage in the end, after everything was said and done. They did have a River Rossi Blue Goose on a display track, which in my opinion was quite cool to see and actually one of my favorite parts of this layout. Now in just a minute you're going to see right there was the reason that I spent so much time at this booth is they had a Fox Valley Models Hiawatha and Consist in operation. 
Um, they ended up having to slow it down because they used block sections and actually ran multiple trains at a time on the same track. So on the opposite end of the layout, there's that diesel freight again. But on the opposite end of the layout, that uh, particular Union Pacific 280 was still going strong. I did end up getting some really nice shots of this thing running, and it was an absolute joy to see. This is one of my dream sets, if I ever have the chance to get my hands on a complete one. I'd really love to find one of these at a reasonable price with five cars. It would be most likely the nicest set that I own. At this point I finally decided to move on, and this was a really interesting and really cool booth. Unfortunately they weren't running anything. This was a 3D printed train service, so they could 3D print different car bodies, prototypes, trucks, and other such things. This is back to that really unusual modular layout that I was talking about earlier that has the boxes for different show scenes. They have this point-to-point -point logging loop with a Bachman DCC 060, and then on the opposite end they had a completed loop with this gorgeous Broadway Limited Paragon 2 NYC Hudson. Now unfortunately someone had somehow managed to lose the headlight for the thing. So as gorgeous as the engine was, it was uh, looking a little unusual. It had a really weird military train on the back of it. There were a lot of people around that layout, so I decided to try to come back to it later, but the crowd never really died down. Now this one was a very interestingly detailed and set up S-gauge layout um, with a Southern 2716 for the Southern Steam program running with a Frisco Meteor consist. Now they did actually have a Frisco Meteor 484, but I never caught them running it on the layout, which was unfortunate. But this was still really cool to see. Now, they would hand you a piece of paper as soon as you walked up that essentially explained that the layout had, I think, over 150 figurines of assorted celebrities and other famous people on it. If that's the sort of thing that you're into, this would have been a really cool layout to hang on. This particular layout had one of my favorite engines running, the Bachman Spectrum 482 Mountain in Chesapeake, Ohio. Uh, I just stopped there to grab this quick little clip of the thing running by. And this is actually one of the last booths that I stopped at. It was not in part of the main show building. Uh, it was a Z-scale layout out near the front, and when I wait, waited to get in that first day, this is what I spent most of my time watching. They had full passenger consists running, and in reality it was quite impressive to actually see. I'd never spent time around a Z-scale layout, and this one was gorgeously detailed and ran very well. Um, this did also win Best in Show for their particular scale, and this was my favorite part of it, the town scene with a lot of really cool like peanut bulbs keeping everything illuminated. And that's going to be it for the main contents of the show. So we're finally going to get to take a look at what I brought home. This is the entire haul. And as you can see, the big purchase was indeed a big purchase. This is an incredibly rare Riverossi set uh, from the AHM import era. I ended up grabbing this Baltimore and Ohio dock cider for $10 after negotiations with the valve gear. These two unusual cars, and we'll get to those in just a minute. This Bachman Santa Fe uh, E-type diesel, I don't know exactly what it is, but that was $20 after negotiations. This was $2. This guy was also $2. I picked up a Bachman Plus engine, which you will see in just a minute. 
Anyways, these cars are really unusual and interesting. I took them out of the wrapping so I could show you. They have a wooden frame construction, molded brass and plastic trucks, and the sides are made out of like this cardstock-like paper. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, you can also see the really unusual coupling method on there. Now, unfortunately, the other one had a broken truck, but um, if anyone knows anything about these cars, please, please let me know because I'd love to know um, what they are from. I picked them up because they were special and unusual, and they were only $3 a piece, so I was kind of glad I did. But I'd love to find out more about them. Please let me know if you have any information on these guys. This is the Bachmann Plus engine that I got, and I'm quite happy. I managed to pick it up for $47 after negotiations. It didn't move for two days, and as I was getting ready to head out, I put in my offer, and they accepted. It is a gorgeous, beautiful condition Bachmann Plus Niagara, number 6005, including the tender. Now, I'm not going to take it out on camera, but I will cut to a shot in just a moment that shows you just how gorgeous this thing is. As you can see, it's quite possibly one of the cleanest Plus Niagara's I've ever laid eyes or hands on, and I'm really excited to get it home and get it running on my layout. Um, it has the original axles, which are still in fine shape right now, but if they ever do split, I will replace them right away with fresh 3D printed ones. And as you can see, this thing has very little to no track time. It is in absolutely gorgeous condition. And now for the main event. I managed to pick up this broad, or excuse me, Riverasi 20th Century Limited set. This was the subject of fierce negoci negotiations. I bought it from the blue tarp guy. His sticker price was $220. I managed to negotiate him down to $130. So I walked away with what I would consider to be a great deal on this with the box in great shape and everything inside looking absolutely gorgeous. The sticker on it says gently used, but I've got to say, this thing has the most minimal wheel wear of any River Rossi engine I've ever really held, except for my brand new inbox Empire State, which has never left the foam. But regardless, this thing is the cleanest 5405 standard I've ever seen, and unusually, it has blacked out handrails. I took the engine out of the packaging just so you can see how pristine this guy is. I haven't removed the cars from their boxes yet, I'm going to save that for when I am home, but you will see this guy running on my layout eventually. So yeah, that is going to be it for this video. I just wanted to share with you all of my acquisitions, purchases, and show you what it was like if you had attended the 2022 Mad City Train Show here in Madison, Wisconsin. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys next time.